Welcome to the thoracic limb. We're going to start out with talking about bones. Okay, our objective is to be able to identify the structures on the limb both by its common name and its anatomical name. We're not going to cover all the structures here that you're responsible for, but highlight many of them. I want you to compare each of the bones proximal to the carpus between the equine, bovine, and canine. Also, compare the arrangement and number of carpal bones as well as the bones distal to the carpus between the three species. Remember that when we are talking about the shoulder, we are talking about that region between the dorsal margin of the scapular cartilage and the shoulder joint. Okay, the point of the shoulder is the cranial part of the greater tubercle of the humerus. The point of the elbow is the olecranon. And one I'm not real fond of, but it's commonly used, is often people will call the carpus the knee. Okay, remember, as in the dog, from the carpus distally, we then switch our terminology from saying cranial and caudal to saying dorsal instead of cranial and palmar instead of caudal. Likewise on the hind limb we're going to use the terms dorsal and plantar. All right, just think of the palm of your hand and you plant your foot. Okay, here we go. Here we have the scapulae. Notice the supraspinous fossa is very reduced. We're going to find that the supraspinatus muscle wraps around more to the medial side than what we saw with the dog. There's the infraspinous fossa. The acromion in the bovine. Notice that the equine does not have an acromion. Neither does it have an acromial head of the deltoideus muscle. Glenoid cavity is basically the articular surface of the scapula. Superglenoid tubercle is cranial to that. Remember this is where the biceps brachii attaches. And over here on the distal end view we can see the coracoid process very nicely right there and yes the coracobrachialis muscle does attach there moving on down to the humerus we find the greater tubercle of the humerus on the lateral aspect lesser tubercle on the medial aspect and unique to the equine we have an intermediate tubercle now the tendon of the biceps brachii doesn't split between the intermediate tubercle, but it does have a depression within it that sits over that intermediate tubercle. Okay, on the bovine you'll notice a very nice circular structure there where the infraspinatus muscle attaches. I have yet to find a name for that. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Deltoid tuberosity is very pronounced. Also indicates the lateral side of the bone. On the medial side we find the teres major tuberosity, which is a little more prominent than what we saw in the dog. Also the brachialis groove is nice and prominent here. The brachialis muscle of course is Okay, the radial fossa, and then of course on the caudal side we have the olecranon fossa. The articular surface distally, we have the trochlea, which is the major portion of the condyle. That more lateral portion there is the capitulum, you recall. Okay, because we do not see it 
from this cranial view of the bones. And I will show you this lateral view so that we can see the head. Remember the head is mostly caudal in orientation. Okay, now moving down to the radius and ulna, we see that we have quite a bit of fusion of our ulna to our radius. Because of this fusion, there's not going to be need for pronators or supinators because they're not going to work real well. <laughs> we do have a pronator teres in the bovine, which is very reduced and slightly flexes the elbow. Remember the point of the elbow is the olecranon. Here now I show the extent of the ulna. It's much more prominent in the bovine, going all the way down along the lateral surface. So also, in addition to the ulna being more lateral, remember up at the olecranon we can see that there's kind of a little hook that hook goes in medially, so that will help your orientation so you can identify the lateral tuberosity on the lateral side versus the radial tuberosity. Remember the radial tuberosity is where the biceps brachii and the brachialis muscles attach. Okay, distally we have the lateral styloid process. On the bovine it is actually on the ulna on the equine, the radius. We have a medial styloid process. Okay, now on this distal end, we're going to find grooves, depressions, that the tendons of muscles pass through. Starting medially, we're going to see that the, there's, it's a little bit of an angle. The extensor carpi obliquus muscle passes through that one. More down the center is going to be the groove for the extensor carpi radialis muscle. A little bit off more laterally is going to be the common digital extensor muscle groove. And then over along the lateral portion we're going to find the groove for the lateral digital extensor. Okay, let's move on down to the carpus now. Okay, starting out, going medially to laterally. Remember the radius, the radial carpal bone. I always like to think of radius medial. So the radial carpal bone here. Notice in the radiographs here, each will be outlined with a color. Okay, so in the center we have an intermediate carpal bone. We did not have this in the canine, but we do see it here in the bovine and the equine. Remember the canine, we had the fused intermedial radial carpal bone. Okay, and then laterally we find the ulnar carpal bone. And then also laterally is the accessory bone. The accessory carpal bone, remember, provides attachment for the ulnaris lateralis and the flexor carpi ulnaris muscles. Moving down to the next row, in the equine we may see the first carpal bone, carpal bone 1, although it may not always be present. We then have the, once again going medial to lateral, the second carpal bone, the much larger third carpal bone. In the bovine we see that there is a fusion of the second and third carpal bones and then in both species we have the fourth carpal bone more laterally okay moving on down to the metacarpal bones starting medially we have the metacarpal 2 which is the medial splint bone Metacarpal 3 is the cannon bone. Metacarpal 4 is the lateral splint bone. Okay, the medial splint bone is often longer. This isn't consistent, but often it is longer. And on the distal ends of the splint bones, we have little 
enlargements referred to as the buttons of the splint, which are palpable. Okay, here we have metacarpal 3 and 4 are fused in the bovine. So here from the lateral view we can see meta, just metacarpal 4. Okay, also on the bovine we have metacarpal 5. On the proximal end of the metacarpus we have the metacarpal tuberosity. This is where the extensor carpi radialis muscle attaches, if you recall. In the bovine between the two metacarpal bones we see a vascular groove. The dorsal metacarpal artery 3 is going to pass down through that vascular groove and then send a branch that goes through the vascular foramen to the palmar side. This is referred to as the distal perforating metatarsal artery. And then we see distally that there's actually two heads of articulation for digits 3 and 4 as well as the proximal sesamoids. Okay, let's not bypass the carpus yet. We need to talk about the, the carpal joints. The most proximal is the radiocarpal, sometimes referred to as antebrachial carpal joint. This one has the largest range of movement. And we have the middle carpal joint, which also has a very large range of movement. And then the carpal metacarpal joint, as you see, not much movement at all. Okay, fortunately, the middle carpal joint does communicate with the carpal metacarpal joint. So that if you inject into the middle carpal joint, it will go into the carpal metacarpal joint. Okay, the, the joints in between the carpal bones on the various rows are referred to as intracarpal joints. Now, something to be aware of, we get to the tarsus, the nomenclature is going to be a little bit different, so we need to be aware of that. Okay, let's move on down to the digit. Here we have the cannon bone once again, metacarpal 3. The first of the phalanges, the first phalanx, is also referred to as the long pastern bone. And the joint is the metacarpal phalangeal joint, or the fetlock joint. So if we were to ask you to identify this joint by its anatomical name, you would say metacarpal phalangeal joint. But if we were to ask what is its common name, you'd tell us the fetlock joint. Okay, then the second phalanx is the short pastern bone. Now this region from the fetlock to the hoof is often referred to as the pastern. And so between these two pastern bones, which anatomically is referred to as the proximal interphalangeal joint, um, is commonly referred to as the pastern joint. Okay, our third or distal phalanx is the coffin bone. I guess because it sits within the hoof as though it is in a coffin. Or some might say, if you get injured to your coffin bone, the horse is in a coffin now. <laughs> Although I have heard of a horse that had a nail penetrate up into its coffin bone and it survived well. Okay, on the third phalanx we do have an extensor process which the common digital extensor muscle is going to attach to. Let's look at this from the lateral side. We have buttons of the splint here. Metacarpal 3, the proximal sesamoid bones are nicely seen now here. There's our long pastern bone, the metacarpal phalangeal joint or the fetlock joint, second phalanx or short pastern bone, the proximal interphalangeal joint, and then our coffin bone, the third phalanx, our distal interphalangeal joint also referred to as the coffin joint. We can st see the extensor process once again right here. And we can also see from this side better on the radiograph is the distal sesamoid bone, which is also referred to as the navicular bone. We'll have another look at that from the palmar view. So here's the proximal sesamoid bones. They're always paired. Distal sesamoid bone is a singular bone, also referred to as the navicular bone. Navicular disease is a 
syndrome that is of much concern in the veterinary field. You will learn more about that. Okay, here's another view showing the distal sesamoid bone. Also, we see here passing through the third pharynx or the foramina solarius, which enter into the semilunar canal. We'll find the medial and lateral palmar digital arteries are going to form a terminal arch through the semilunar canal. In another view, it's important radiologically to look at the distal sesamoid bone here. Okay, we also see here I tag the flexor surface. Flexor surface is where the deep digital flexor muscle tendon will attach. Okay, let's have a look at the bovine now. They're okay, going to have the same digital bones. We'll just have digit 3 and digit 4. So when we have a reduction of digits, we start out by losing the first digit and then the fifth digit and so animals with three toes have the second third and fourth digit okay so we went first fifth and we come back to the medial side lose the second so that the bovine and other two digit animals stand on the third and fourth digit okay so we went medial lateral medial so then we go lateral again so horses are reduced down to the third digit because we lost the fourth okay so in the bovine, we've got the first phalanx of digit 4, the second phalanx of digit 4 or digit 3. Okay, so if we ask you to identify it, you need to say which phalanx of which digit. So you need to be specific that way. Okay? And then, of course, the third phalanx, often referred to as the pedal bone, of the third and fourth digit. Okay, we see from the, more so from the palmar view, we can see the proximal sesamoids. Notice that they are once again paired for each digit. The distal sesamoid is going to be single for each digit, just as it was in the horse. We have extensor processes where the common digital extensor tendon is going to attach. And the deep digital flexor tendon is going to attach upon the flexor tubercle in this case. Okay, now in this middle image, I drew a line up the middle, basically the axis. Okay, this is important in our terminology because the side of the digit towards that axis is going to be the axial surface, and the side away from that axis is going to be the abaxial surface. So when we're talking about the proximal sesamoids, we can say that those that are towards the axis are the axial sesamoids, of digit 3 and digit 4, or we can refer to the abaxial sesamoids of digit 3 or digit 4. Okay? Because I love locomotion, some of the modifications for speed that we've mentioned here is that we have a reduction of the bones on the distal limb. This is going to reduce the, the amount of effort the animal has to make to change direction of the limb. So as the limb is going forward, to change the direction to go then caudally or when it's going caudally to change the direction to go forward because there's less momentum with less weight it makes it conserving their energy okay we're going to also find the elongation of the distal limb bones as you saw this elongation is going to increase the stride length we'll talk more about those modifications as we go all right that's all i got for you hope you enjoyed this